Hi, this is Pastor Danny Deeth, and I'm so excited that you have chosen to join us here at First Presbyterian Church for worship today. Know that the love, grace, mercy, and joy of Jesus Christ beckon you to join our church family as we seek to celebrate our journey with Christ in this service of worship. So we're glad you're here. Come on in. The first lesson today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. This is in page 192 on the New Testament in your pew Bibles. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what it is to hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the workings of his great power. God put this power to work in Jesus in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly place, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills in all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is our gospel reading for the day. We're taking it from Luke's gospel. We're in Luke 6, verses 20 through 31. Listen for the word of the Lord. Then he looked at, at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who were rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is when their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, when the go marching in, oh, when the go marching in, oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. Hurts a little bit. When the go marching in. Very good. Very good. That song, When the Saints Go Marching In, classic. Um, my dad's side of the family is all from New Orleans. It's a staple in jazz and Dixieland jazz. Um, goes back to the early 1900s, 1923. First recording that we know about is the, the Paramount Kingdom Singers, 1923, to people like Bo Weevil Jackson, 
That's a great name, isn't it? Bull Weevil Jackson, uh, 1926, but the definitive recording from Louis Armstrong in 1938 on Decca Records. Um, it's hard to know who first wrote it. The, the verses kind of come and go. It, it's been spiritual. It's been uh, secularized. Um, all kinds of different people recording. But that definitive one by Louis Armstrong, again, was the one that kind of set it as a cultural piece for our country and for the world. What's its message? Very simply, when the saints, and depending on the version, sometimes the saints are, go, when the saints go marching in, sometimes they come marching in, sometimes they are marching in. But for the one that we are more familiar with, it's when the saints go marching in, which is kind of an end times, those saints going home to be with God, God's kingdom, heaven, however we want to think about that. Oh, when the saints, and oh Lord, I want to be in that number. So how do we get to be one of those saints and be in that number? Well, today is All Saints Sunday, where we celebrate and think about those who have gone before us in faith, who Christ has already brought home to claim their place at their banquet table, their room in Christ's mansion, that place where they are together forever with God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty good place where we're all trying to go, but we can also experience glimpses of that here. So in Paul's letter to the Ephesians today, the, the whole first half of the book of Ephesians is about thanksgiving for salvation in Jesus Christ, and the second half is more about how to be a new creation in Christ. So it's about giving thanks for what God did through Christ, and then how to live and how to look toward the future in living as one of these new disciples of this Jesus that came not too long ago for them. So what Paul is reminding us on this All Saints Day is that it's important to look behind and it's important to look ahead. In Roman mythology, um, the Roman god Janus, J-A-N-U-S, was the one who was in charge of transitions, new beginnings, new starts, from which our month January comes from this Roman God. Why? It's the first month of the new year where we celebrate transitions and new beginnings and new starts. But the way that they depicted the God Janus was to have a two-faced mask. Now, today, when we say someone is two-faced, that's not a good thing. That means you're pretending to be something you're not, or maybe you told somebody here something, and then you told somebody else on the same matter something completely different, that you're being a hypocrite or not true to yourself, not true with Janus. This was a compliment. It simply was the way they thought of this God. Two-faced, one looking back and one looking forward. Because on All Saints Day, it's the time where we look back to those who have loved us and passed faith along to us so that we can continue to look ahead to where our lives are taking us. Now, if we think about those, often their family members, about those saints who have gone before us, and that's not always good or happy memories. But for many, it is our families that passed faith on to us that we seek to continue to pass faith on to those that we love and to the world. <clears throat> one of the things that is so difficult, and one of the things I often do in premarital counseling, is to talk to the bride and the groom about their family of origin. Why? Because no matter if they had the best family in childhood in the world or the worst, 
whether they had great parents who loved them and sought to love them or those who didn't, whether they had a stable environment or whether they didn't, that is their context. And when they come into a marriage, they're bringing that with them, whether they want to or not. Sometimes we say, well, my parents are great, but I would do this differently and that. Well, of course you do. But we also need to realize that where we have come from shapes us where we currently are. There's a movie in 1997 called Amistad and was about uh, slaves uh, in the late 1800s um, who were uh, abducted and taken from a Spanish slave ship on the way to Cuba. In the midst of that journey, there was an uprising by those who had been abducted, who would be slaves. They took over this boat, this ship, but eventually they were seized and brought to trial in the United States. Now, if you remember, Matthew McConaughey was in this movie, Morgan Freeman, uh, Anthony Hopkins played John Quincy Adams, and it centered around the trial of what to do with them. Would they be charged of murder or would they be sent home and freed? And a part that I want us to think about isn't as much the injustice and the horror of it as it is the one scene where Anthony Hopkins, as John Quincy Adams, is talking to the Supreme Court on behalf of those who had been abducted and said, I have sat down and had dinner with at least one of these so-called slaves. And one of the things they talked to us about was how in desperate and difficult times we call upon the wisdom of our ancestors. We call upon the wisdom of our ancestors to bring us comfort, to bring us aid and support. And that is and still is a very big part of their tradition and their understanding of how those who had gone before them are still present in their lives. And so this scene concludes with John Quincy Adams then saying to the, the Supreme Court, what we came to understand is that who we are now, who we are, is what we were. Who we are is what we were. Again, this idea that our past feeds into who we are now and moving forward. It's one of the things that we celebrate on an All Saints Sunday. For me, it was my family, and I know it was for many of us. We went to church every Sunday, and I hated much of it. Didn't want to be there. I wasn't always going to be a minister. <laughs> but it's what we did. I remember feigning illness so I wouldn't have to go to church. I remember being both mad and pretending to cry because I didn't want to go to church. But it didn't matter. It's just what we did. We had the memorial service for Helen Richards uh, on Friday who died, member of this church, faithful core member of this congregation and her sons, uh, Bill and Cliff. When I spoke with them before the service, they said, please make everyone understand how central a part the church played in our life. And they told us stories about how they came to church. It was just what they did, how they grew up in Sunday school in the youth program, how they played softball on the church softball team, and how every step of their journey, the church was there. And it wasn't a question, are we going to church or not? It's just what they did. It wasn't the last great event. It wasn't the next great event. It wasn't the things that were trying to razzle-dazzle. It was just what they did. Whatever was going on, good or bad, whether they connected to it or not, they were just at church. And that's what the parents instilled, Bill and Helen, on their sons, Bill and Cliff. And still so much a part of who they are that they remember all of that and how important it was. We had people like that in our lives. Think, I want you to think of one person whose face you can see. 
that was someone who helped you on your journey in faith. Maybe it was a family member, maybe it was a friend, maybe it was a coach or a teacher or the neighbor down the street, the person who invited you to worship, the person who taught you in Sunday school or a youth advisor. Hold that person right there. Because today's the day we want those people to be proud of us. Again, often it is our family, but sometimes it's not. But whoever it was, we want them to know we are here and we are seeking faith. Of course, we want them to be proud of us in our faith journey as well. There's a story about a coach at Columbia University, Lou Little. And you, you think you know where this is going, but just, just hang with me. And when they had football tryouts this particular year, there was a young man who tried out for the varsity team who had no business being on the varsity team. He was small. He was not very capable, not very coordinated, not very fast, not very strong. But he loved this kid's spunk, his pluck, his positivity that he brought to the team, the way he encouraged his teammates. Coach thought, well, maybe I'll bring him on. He, he'll ride the bench. He'll never see a minute, but he'll be good for the rest of the team. So he did, brought this young man on. So throughout the season, the coach, Lou Little, began to enjoy his relationship with this young man. Again, he was positive, did really have positive effects on the team. Never saw a minute of playing time, but that coach knew that. One of the things Coach appreciated about this young man was that when his dad would come to visit, they would walk arm in arm on the campus together, showing their obvious love for one another, their closeness, their relationship. He would come to practice and set him down while he was at practice, and they went to the university chapel. Folks saw him coming and going to show their Christian faith was a big part of who they were. Well, not too long after that, the young man's father dies. And they call the coach and say, Could you, you need to let him know. And so he does. And he says, before you go home, if there's anything I can do, I will help you in any way that I can. I promise, I'll make you a promise. Whatever I can do for you, I will. So the young man goes home, has the service about a week, week and a half later. He comes back and comes to practice again. And coach says, I hope you're doing okay. I told you before, I'd do anything for you. What, what can I do for you? He said, Coach, I want to play on Saturday. You, you what now? Coach, I need you to put me in on Saturday. Coach is thinking, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? It's the end of the season. One of our biggest games is Saturday. He's not up to the task. That's not why I brought him on the team. He was lucky to be there in the first place. He doesn't have the skill required that hadn't developed amazingly during the year. He said, Coach, you promised me you'd do anything I asked, and I'm asking you to please put me in on Saturday. <laughs> so the coach says, okay, two plays. Two plays. I'll get him in. I'll get, get, get him two plays, one play if it's bad, and I'll get him out. Then he can have his game time, and it won't hurt the team. So he goes in, and don't you know it? The first play on defense, makes it through the offensive line, tackles the running back with the ball for a loss. Everybody kind of looks at each other, what? what? Second play, similar. Third play, fourth play. Coach keeps him in for the rest of the quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter. So inspired did this young man play that his teammates voted him the player of the game. So afterwards, the coach comes and says, what in the world? You've been holding back? He said, why did you, what, what got into you today? He said, coach, there's a little secret that my dad and I had. Nobody knew it, but my dad was completely blind and has been my whole life. When you saw us walking arm in arm, it's because he was blind, but he didn't want anybody to know. And today, was the first day that my dad ever saw me play football. We all want those people that we love to be proud of us because we have a sense that they are in touch with us somehow 
looking down on us, wishing us well, as the ancestors did on that ship. Sometimes we need to remember and claim from where we have come to know where we are going. We know who we are by where we were. And so Paul is telling us again that those whom we love have an impact on us even now. Those Ephesians were to look back to the event of Christ and then look forward to how they were going to live their life as a disciple in this new life that was offered. But it's not just claiming that old and looking ahead. Who's looking to us as saints? In our Protestant, Reformed, Presbyterian tradition, we honor saints, not in the same way as some of our other Christian family does. We don't go through saints to get to Christ. We don't go through saints to get to God. You don't go through anybody to get to Christ. You have direct access. I don't have to listen to all of your confessions, and for that I am grateful. But for us, saints is a broader category, simply meaning those who believe. There are living saints. Paul, when he starts his letter to the Ephesians, says, to the saints. He's not talking about writing, he's not writing a letter to dead people. He's writing a letter to the people in Ephesus, those who are seeking to follow Christ. Being a saint doesn't mean you have it all figured out. Being a saint doesn't mean you never have doubts or you never have fears or you never stray from God or you never struggle with scripture or prayer or service or worship or fellowship or any of it. I would say conversely, being a saint means that you do, but that you have belief enough, that you know enough to make that decision to follow Christ and welcome that Holy Spirit into your world and life so that you can be a saint to those here and now. Who is it that we are passing our faith on to today? Adults, youth, and children. We all have that ability to be saints now. Who is it that maybe one day will look to us and remember at an all saint service in the next 10 years, the next 50 years, the next 100 years, and give thanks because we shared our faith with them or we made them go to church even when they didn't want to because it's just what we did. Today, the joy is in remembering that we inherit such a rich tradition of faith, and love, and light, and challenge, and struggle, all of it discipleship. So my encouragement to you today is continue to be enlightened by the Word of God. Paul talks about that in this section. Continue to open the eyes of your hearts by learning, by seeking. And to be a saint doesn't mean you have it all figured out. It means you are seeking to follow Christ as a disciple. And who can we pass our faith on to so that they will know the glory, the grace, and the love of our risen Savior? That is our challenge today. So let us go to claim from where we have come, where we are going, and as the blessed saints of Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Amen.